<laughs> Welcome everybody to, uh, I think this is the third in our series of webinars. We had a self-compassion webinar uh, with Caroline Faulkner, Tatiana Karova did her, her webinar, uh, I think it was last month, on mini selves, and now we're, we're very privileged to have David Carter back with us to do this webinar on um, uh, supervision. Uh, just something about the way this webinar works. Let me share. I'll share my screen. So the, um, the the subject of this is supervision, and I know that there's some people who are participants who are coaches. Uh, I think there's also some consultants and there's clinicians. So we've got quite a group in, quite a mixed group in here, for whom I think supervision is relevant for everybody. Um, Certainly for my part, I've been in supervision for, I, I think it's 25 years. I did a bit of a count-up this morning, which is kind of scary, really. Uh, and that's in group supervision, one-to-one -one supervision. Um, and then uh, some time ago, I did a, a, a diploma in supervision to become a supervisor. Um, so it's quite strongly, and has been strongly connected with my practice for quite a while. So this is, this is quite familiar territory for me. Uh, so before we go into um, the presentation by uh, David, we'd like to do a little bit of a poll just to see where everybody else is up to with supervision. Um, so we've got a few questions to ask you as participants, and everybody please answer. I, I think this is going to be anonymous. Uh, Mikhail, do you want to run us through the poll? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, just in a second, you all see the poll on the screen. So please check your... Take your answers for those questions. Take a couple of minutes and so we've got the first answers here. So just in a in a minute I will share the results with you. So please those who not voted yet here, so please give you your answers. Okay, so it's like four, three, two, one. Okay, <laughs> so let's see the results on the screen. So, ah, Eighty percent in supervision, okay. Great, that's good. I like that kind of result. Keep going down then. What have we got then, Mikhail? Um, so other reasons. And a lot of people doing remote supervision with a professional. That's great to hear as well. And some doing supervision with their colleagues. Yeah, that's really interesting. The remote um, supervision is starting to become a much more convenient way of doing your supervision. And of course, a lot of you here today, or many of you, I think, are working with ProReal, so you'll understand the relevance of that. Um, so I'd like to introduce Professor David Clutterbuck, who's, who's um, co-founder of the EMCC and author of 54 books. Um, and I and I check these on um, on Amazon, and I'm going to share with you a link uh, to Amazon's site where you can see all 54 books, which in anybody's lifetime is quite an achievement. Um, David, you and I, I think we, we met at Ashridge, and I know that three, four years ago when I introduced David to um, Pro Real. Ever since then, he's been a really big supporter of everything that we've been doing. And uh, I know, David, we've also, we also, both of us do some work at Oxford Brooks with the coaching and the supervision work that they do. His book is called Coaching Supervision. Uh, it's David Carroll Whitaker, Michelle uh, Lucas. And yours truly has a mention in there. I know I have a little bit to do with that book, but that book's just been published uh, by Routledge. Um, worth having a look at on Amazon. 
And I, and I did notice, David, with so many books of yours on Amazon, I think that's why they built the additional warehouse on Amazon. <laughs> uh, the, the other thing worth saying is, is there's something about he, he's in the top 15, uh, inverted commas, of HR's most influential. Um, so I, I think we're very honored to have you here today, David, to talk about um, coaching supervision. So, Professor David Clutterbuck, over to you. Thank you very much, David. Um, so let's uh, let's crack into this fascinating subject of, of supervision. Um, supervision is something that is um, has been growing quite rapidly in the last decade. Um, from very few coaches having supervision uh, uh, ten years ago, we now find that um, a considerable proportion of them, and primarily the co the coaches, are at the top of the profession. So the more serious people are about about their about their coaching, the more serious they tend to be about their super, their supervision. It's not a uniform picture. Um, <clears throat> there is more supervision, or you're more likely to have supervision in uh, in Europe than you are in the United States, for example, um, for a variety of, of reasons, both cultural and also um, from, from from legalistic issues as, as well. Um, but we're seeing uh, the professional bodies come together to encourage supervision, to make it parts of their codes of practice, um, and, and, in, and indeed to set stand, joint standards of what expectations of what supervision is about and what, and, and, and what the quality of supervision should be. So we're beginning to see a, a, a massive movement here. Well, <clears throat> what um, I and my colleagues started to investigate a few years ago was what does it actually mean for the supervisee, for the coach who's going to be supervised. So the uh, the focus of what I'm going to be talking about is less on the on the on the supervisor, but on the person receiving. I say coach, and I also mean professional mentor as well, um, because clearly um, there's such a crossover between the two roles um, uh, at a professional level that uh, it works for both. If we think about um, coaching supervision from the definitions. That we've been given uh, over time. One of the earliest definitions is by, my, by um, of, of, of supervision as opposed to coaching supervision. It comes from um, Michael Carroll. Um, and he says that supervision is a forum where supervisees review and reflect on their work in order to do it better. So he's emphasizing the reflective process. Um, whereas uh, Tatiana Bakirova, who some of you will no doubt have, have listened to um, in the last of these webinars, describes coaching supervision as a formal process of professional support that ensures continuing development of the coach and effectiveness of his or her coaching practice through interactive reflection, interpretive evaluation, and the sharing of expertise. So Tatiana emphasizes the, the collaborative nature of this. And we tried to pull all this together into a, a more comprehensive uh, uh, definition uh, and what we've succeeded in doing is producing a very long one um, but if you could have the next slide please David um, here we go um, and here as you can see we've, we've highlighted some of the critical things uh, in, in red but it's a collaborative process facilitating coaches and coach supervisors to grow their reflective practice with a view to continuous improvement and professional development client safety and the strengthening of professional identity the process considers the entire system surrounding the supervisee and their client work and seeks to bring value to all those stakeholders connected to that work. So we're looking at a much broader picture of supervision here, something that actually has an impact not beyond the relationship uh, of the coach to their client or the coach to the supervisor, but actually, but actually the entire ecosystem in which the, in which the, uh, the coach works. So this is, this is quite challenging to do this, and we're, we're beginning to see that this, this sense of systemic uh, supervision, um, or, or supervision focusing on the systemic issues, um, as being all, almost mainstream now. Um, and certainly this seems to be an important part of it. So if we think about what coaching is for, <laughs> the, the four things that are normally talked about are the first ones here. It's normally, it, it, it's formative, it's about the education and development of the coach, of the coach's practice. Their, 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 their insight into how they coach so that they can actually become uh, more, um, more knowledgeable um, and put that knowledge into practice. Normative is, about, is, is typically about safety, it's about, it's about how do you make sure that what you're doing meets the standards required of effective um, so, so, um, or an effective coach. Um, how do you make sure? How, how do you make sure that you are are not 
projecting on your, your clients, for example, or abusing the clients or, or crossing boundaries. Restorative is probably one of the biggest issues because restorative functions are really about helping the coach to have to look after themselves. Um, there's, there is an increasing issue of coach burnout. Um, and we're seeing uh, the, the phrase is, with, with the constant is, is emotional contagion. Um, coaches tend to try and be empathetic, which is perhaps not what they should be. Um, uh, we'll come back to that later. We, they should be much more compassionate than, uh, the, than, than empathetic. Um, but in, if they identify too much with their clients, it becomes draining. And particularly if you've got clients who've got real difficulties, it, it can actually be emotionally exhausting. For, for the client, so actually helping to re-establish your 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 energies, your self-belief, um, a restorative function is a really important part of it. And then performative, it's, it's about how, how do you how do you actually continue to, to to make sure that you have an impact? How do you how do you know what what, what, what you're doing is 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 worthwhile with it or help really helping those those clients? How it, how are you developing in a broader sense? But increasingly, we're finding that supervision also covers the business. How do I actually, as a coach, run a, a, or create a, a business that suits my identity and my interests and, uh, and so forth? So um, I think the, these five things seem to be the, the primary reasons that people go to supervision or the primary functions of supervision. What we find with virtual supervision is it provides a safe space in which you can, you can discuss <coughs> all of these issues. Um, you can step back. You can look at them from a different perspective. Um, and if on, on the restorative ones, for example, it's not about being dispassionate so much as being able to place the emotions in context. We want to actually use the emotions that, that we have. And creating and, and, and operating in a, in a virtual world uh, allow, allows us to cut that little bit of distance between what's happening for us, inside us and inside our clients and inside the system. Um, so that we can we can look at it and actually understand the dynamics of the systems in which we are operating. So when we think about what makes for good supervision, the there's lots of things that happen, but the, these seem to be the ones that have come up from our research as the, as the critical factors. If you don't trust your supervisor, you've got a problem. Indeed, if the supervisor doesn't trust the coach, there's an issue too. Um, so this building of trust can can you, do you custody and respect um, the, the two two elements, two sides of the same coin really, is an important part of the whole package. And we 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 have some data on how coaches build trust. We don't have necessarily as much data on how supervisors or coach supervisors in particular build trust. Um, this 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 notion of, of challenge versus support. When we look at the dimensions of coaching, we, we are there to support we, we, these same dimensions come up. Um, indeed, in mentoring, uh, challenge versus support really are two, uh, was one of the core dimensions in which we would, we would look at uh, what, uh, what mentors do, because mentors essentially are there to help us rise above our, our, our situation and our, and, our, and our current thinking. At the same time, give us the, 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 allow us to support ourselves or, or feel supported in achieving more than we thought that we could. The spirit of curiosity. It seems that curiosity for, for, for me is what is one of the core competencies or core values um, of a well-functioning individual. And <clears throat> if you come to supervision wanting to understand, wanting to understand what's happening in your internal dynamics and the systems and, 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 and the, the, the dynamics between you and the client, if you're, if you're really keen to understand these things, then um, it's, uh, it, it makes for an investigation, your you experiment. Um, so uh, m most supervisors, most supervisees that we talk to, our, talk to, talked about the experimentation that actually allowed them to get deeper into, the, in, into an understanding of themselves and their practice. The, the, the gray areas are the things that we normally don't talk about. Some of the recent research um, uh, by, by um, uh, the Bath Consultancy came up with some class, it was a clear idea that, me that many coaches avoid taking some things to their coach to their supervisor sometimes out of shame for all sorts of different reasons but these gray areas things that we are half conscious of um, that we don't quite know how to explore supervision gives us a, 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 a gives us a, a method of doing this 
And of course, in virtual supervision, the gray becomes, you, 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 not only can you exactly give it different colors, but you can, you can actually, you can see the gray on the horizon. You're allowed, you, you allow yourself to see what you wouldn't allow yourself to see in reality. The notion that the coach and the supervisor are learning together I, uh, is, is also important. I get some of the most interesting uh, concepts and ideas and things that I want to write about from the supervision sessions that I, that, that I hold with coaches. Um, <clears throat> also this issue of where, well, where might we be bringing unconscious bias into, in, in, into the conversation. There is a reflective process here where, where what happens in the supervision is a reflection of what often happens in the coaching. And therefore, by, uh, by unearthing this, we can begin to see, again, the system's dynamic. And of course, when, coach, when super coaching supervision works, it's not something that the coach supervisor does to the coach. This is a, this is a joint activity, a joint exploration um, of, of issues that the, coaching, the coach wishes to bring. So I think it, 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 it's hard to be passive in a virtual environment when you do these things. It's easier to get away with just having the conversation you'd like to have uh, that's easy and, 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 uh, and not too demanding in a face-to-face -face or, or, or ordinary um, co coaching conversation. But for me, the virtual world actually helps to, to get beyond that passivity and, to, and, and, and really to, to, to leaves you uh, more opportunities to open up these issues. Coaching supervision isn't the same as coaching you know, or as supervision in other areas like, for example, um, psychotherapy. Um, <clears throat> it's usually done on a voluntary basis. So if somebody says, I want to do this um, because it's going to be helpful to me. The coaching clients are different because they basically um, are, they, they tend to be people who are well um, uh, and who are simply trying to cope with opportunities as much as with, with problems. They may identify something as, 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 a, as a problem they want to work on. Um, but it's not necessarily that something that is that is making them dysfunctional. It's just we're just helping them become more functional. Um, uh, we also find that there's lots of stakeholders because <clears throat> there's not only the coach, the, the, the coachee, but there's the coachee's boss. There's their team, if it's a team that people that work run. So there are multiple multiple players in this, and that makes um, that makes coaching more complex. Um, but also, but also, and also creates lots of uh, of, of interesting dynamics, um, so that we can we we can look at how the various people connected or, or with with the with the client um, are influencing them and how they are influencing those those diff, those various people. So again, the virtual world world creates a really good opportunity to put this all into context. Um, <clears throat> Having multiple stakeholders is, 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 is just core to the whole uh, process of coaching. Um, the commercial context too, most, co most coaches are trying to, uh, are not paid by somebody, by a, a central body to, 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 reach, to see a lot of patients. They are actually pay, they, they are paid by the individual or by the company um, or in, in a very different kind of commercial arrangement. And that does impact how you, uh, how they, they they, they devise their work or how they, how they perceive their work. Um, it, it, it's, I think it's, it's quite, quite interesting for me to, 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 to see how some coaches um, actually want to hang on to clients because they are their source of income. Now, there are all sorts of dangers of creating dependency there. Um, and so, so the, 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 need, the commercial need for the coach and the, um, and the client's need can sometimes actually come into conflict. So this is very much the kind of thing that comes out in, in supervision, good supervision, but it can be made even more vivid in a virtual environment. If we look at the various models of, coach, of coaching supervision, most people will be familiar with this one. This comes from, from Stephen Hawkins and, and Nick Smith. Um, and here you've got you know, the, 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 the seven critical eyes that he calls little seven modes, um, uh, which relate to the clients, the, what's happening for the clients, what the client is, what the coach is trying to do to help the client, the relationship between them, and how that affects the way the kind of conversation they have, what's going on inside the coach, um, what's going in, on inside the supervision uh, process, uh, and, the, and what's what 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 the supervisor is thinking themselves, and how they are interacting with the with the coach and with the the wider the wider conversation of the. Uh, of the client, and then just the bigger context, what's actually happening that is influencing this whole ecosystem. 
So that's one way of looking at it. And it certainly helps in the analysis of what's going on in coaching. And you can take all of these positions in a, in a, in, in a virtual environment. But equally, if we take this, the, the, the seven conversations, um, <clears throat> there what we found is, is that um, coaches tend to take notice of the spoken conversation that forms the core of, of the, the coaching session. But actually, there <clears throat> the seven conversations, there's two conversations that happen with, before the coaching session. One in the head of the coach and one in the head of the coachee. And for the coach, it's thinking about things like, okay, um, what, what, what am I looking forward to this? How have I been helpful in the past? Um, what is it? Do I like this person? Um, what am I? What am I bringing into this coaching conversation, uh, the supervision conversation, which might help or might get in the way? And the coach, the coach themselves, brings a whole load of, 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 of sessions uh, um, uh, of issues uh, around their uh, around their coaching. So, what is it, what, what's happening for me when I'm? Uh, for, or what's happening? Sorry, the coach, the client of the coach. It's very, very easy to get mixed up in all these multiple perspectives, I have to say. So the client of the coach, in their mind, um, is, is looking at looking at things um, from a point of view of what should I bring to, what, what, how do I express this issue that I've got? Um, how honest am I be, uh, can I be to the coach about this? What examples would I want to do to, 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 to give? Um, what pre-thinking I, have I done around this? And then you've got the coaching session itself. You've got the main conversation, and then you've got the conversation in the head of the coach, for example. Is my intuition turned on? What am I actually observing and not observing here? Am I, should I ask this question or should I hold back from asking that question? And the coachee, can, what, what should I, uh, how honest can I be again? Um, what, what, do, what, what am I trying to avoid here? Am I trying to talk myself um, to, 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 to actually avoid approaching the issue by talking, by talking too much? All of these things will be going on in, in, the, in the coachee's mind. And then after the session, for the coachee, it's, well, what am I going to do with this, uh, this conversation that we've had? Who else do I need to talk to? Um, how committed I am to doing anything about this? And then the coach, how helpful was I? What actually happened? What, 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 did I, what can I learn from analyzing what questions I chose to ask and didn't ask? What do I want to take to supervision? So in these, each of these conversations has a life of its own. And what we find is that the majority of the time when something goes wrong or doesn't seem to be working within a coaching relationship, it's not the key, co the spoken conversation that is the one where the problem lies. It's usually in one or more of the other six conversations. So what we can do in, in using either of these models is, is, is to actually take multiple perspectives. Um, and, and that's the way that we, um, that, that we can help the, the, the coachee, uh, sorry, help the coach to think about what do I want to bring to supervision from their own perspective and also from the perspective of their client and from, from different directions and different and, and of course the virtual representations allow us to look at things in different sizes, um, different colors, a whole different way, different set of ways of, of bringing to life these separate um, modes and these separate conversations. So from our work, what makes a good supervisee, one of the first things that we came, came up with was, are they ready for supervision? One of the biggest issues we find that people that causes people to come to supervision is a sense that they need to have more self-care. Um, so to be kind, one of the things that, that um, I increasingly find myself doing as a supervisor is helping people to learn how to, or coaches to learn how to be kind to themselves. Um, and, and, and helping them to not to, to expect too much of their coaching relationship, not to ex expect constantly to, to, that they've got to come up with a solution on behalf of the, of the client. So there's a whole range of issues that is somebody ready to really go into these issues and, and, and look at themselves and in a, in a, uh, from, a, from a, a fairly challenging perspective as to what they do and why they do it and what they feel and why they feel it. So do they also um, also want know how to or, or, or really want to, to access supervision from the point of view of do they see its value? Um, are they looking more for reassurance or more for insight so, or for learning? If they're looking mostly for reassurance, <coughs> then, th then the emphasis is, is, is probably wrong that, that they will have to work for some time to get to a, a, a um, a supervision relationship that's really going to deliver, deliver value. In fact, what often happens is that people seek reassurance from peers, um, not least because peers are likely to be more, to, to be less relentless in questioning what they do. 
Um, the engagement with the process, I think, is important too. Are, are they open to, to challenge? Are they, are they curious? Do they have this, uh, this mastery, so this learning orientation versus, versus this, the achievement, so this limited to, 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 to sort of finding solutions? Um, do they know who they work best with, or are they prepared, are they interested in finding out who they work best with? It's important that they they really are an equal participant, so they don't expect the co the supervisor to do all the work. Um, that doesn't always mean that you have to come to supervision with a clear idea of what you want to talk about. Sometimes having sessions where you are um, where, where you are deliberately going with an open agenda can be amongst the most revealing. Knowing when it's appropriate to change the supervisor too. Um, we outgrow our supervisors just as we outgrow all sorts of other parts of our lives. And so recognizing that this is something that, that will happen and negotiating with the supervisor to make sure that it does happen. Um, and yes, active prepara preparation is important, um, but it may be simply to think about all the things you could have talked talk about, but without necessarily selecting the one you're going to go for on the day. Um, so if we look at the kinds of supervision that we have, this one-to-one -one supervision face-to-face. -face. Um, uh, also, it's one-to-one -one supervision, which could be in various ways. It could be group supervision, and that could be single supervisor or, or, or two supervisors together. And the good models are both those. Supervision could be face-to-face, -face. it can use distance media, it can be with peers, um, but that tends to be, that, well, there are big problems with peer supervision in the sense that it tends to be uh, less investigatory, investigatory um, and to have shallower levels of insight. Um, you can self-supervise, and indeed we can come back to that, but it's one of the most important areas, I think, that we develop our skills of self-supervision. And then we can have virtual supervision, um, um, in, in, as we're going to demonstrate, or David is going to demonstrate later. Um, and looking at the last one of virtual supervision, what it does is give us, uh, it, it, it's, it gives us more comfortable. We, we, you have to be comfortable when working with technology to do it, but it, it, most people can learn to do that. It does give you this creative, emotional motive, and this reflective space, the time to step back and think, and it gives you reflective space in more than one dimension. So we, we, we think about reflective space as something where we have the time, but now we've got a reflective space where, the, where we have the vision, the, the vision as well. Um, it does allow us to, have to, 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 let, to, to bring into play different perspectives and to capture them in front and so, so that we don't lose them. Um, it, it, it does calm people down because you can distance yourself from it just enough to be able to be, though if not dispassionate, um, apassionate, as we would say. Um, and of course, it, 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 we, we know that remote working lowers people's inhibitions about, about things. We know people will say anything on Facebook, remarkably, um, that they wouldn't say face to face. It reduces the power distance so that we know that coaching and mentoring, for example, delivered by email, um, tends to have tends again to have a much deeper quality of it, of of, um, uh, of dialogue um, when it, it, when people are at different levels of power distance um, <clears throat> and of course like any other kind of co of, of, of coaching and supervision it has to have um, careful contracting you have to think about what do we want to get from each other and how are we going to do this how you choose to supervise might be a bit to do with your personality some people like Something, some different ways of learning more than others. Uh, and, and, and certainly learning style has an impact. I'm going to talk about stage of maturity as a coach later, but, but certainly the more mature you are, the more likely you are to, 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 you, to seek a, a form of coach, of, of, of coach supervision that really challenges you and really helps you to think through in a systemic way. Um, if you are less mature as a coach, you're more likely to be looking for some kind of transactional help and, di and fix and, qu and quick fixes, um, which, is not which is not to say that's not valuable, but it would tend not to be, have the depth that a, um, that a mature coach would look for. Obviously, the more comfortable you are with technology, the easier it is for you to do these, and how much you're prepared to pay. You know, um, people will, if, if, if you are not prepared to, pay, to, um, to, to invest in your development through supervision, then um, then there are or you can go for, to group supervision which is cheaper um, but you may but but, but you know, how much you're prepared to pay is, is a question that is a fundamental one I think in this is the whole argument so what we find we, we looked at, at the skills of a supervisee well firstly we found that, they, that there was a lot of critical self-reflection so uh, you you would actually start asking 
yourself lots of questions and, and almost have a pre-session before you um, before you have you go to supervision so you you would think about you take up you would if you have notes you would you would reflect on those you you would you, you would deeply try and understand what is going on for me in my um, in, in, in the coaching sessions that I've had you'd look for themes and patterns um, and that might be words that are coming up or 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 themes or, or concepts that keep recurring, um, or, or or just 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 things that, that are just just patterns that get repeated. So I took to supervision at one stage, and the fact that um, quite a few of the people I, I were in within the first ten minutes were crying, um, and I was concerned. You know, what was I doing something wrong? And it was just part. It, we it turned out to be the selection of clients that I had at that time, uh, and the fact that these people gravitated towards me, and uh, and the kind of question of, of depth that we were getting into. Um, but it was useful to, ana to analyze this to make so that I could understand what's going on. Um, partly also we want to be able to, to, um, to, to integrate what we're getting from the, the insights we get from the, the, from, the, uh, from the supervision into the way that we practice. So when we get new knowledge, how do we put it to, how, how do we, from, from the supervision, how do we put it together with what we do? But equally, if we've been getting new knowledge from other sources, um, how can, can the supervisor can help you think through how does that all pull together? How, how, do we, how do I link all of those things together into my personal philosophy of coaching? Then there's the boundaries. You know, how do we actually recognize the boundaries that, 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 we, are, that we might bounce up against, which we, which we might not otherwise be aware of? Um, the intuition. What is going on for us that we're not quite sure of be something there? And what we can do in, 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 in supervision is articulate that, that, that and, and basically begin to draw it out. And that's really, really much related to our, our sense of self-awareness um, and other awareness as well, but particularly what is going on for us as we coach and between when we coach. And this issue of multiple perspectives comes in time and time again. So what we found is you can develop this whole process of self-reflection before we have um, a um, a coaching session if we um, by doing things like having a, a, a learning log um, by joining lots of communities that actually have where we can learn from other coaches and other people on the edge of coaching some of the most interesting learning comes from people who are not coaches but in and other similar disciplines or are doing things which are just which are which are are relevant because they they open our mind up to different learning that's happening from different places of coaching literature keeping up with it is hard but picking and choosing the things which you feel are really going to help you think more deeply about how you coach and why um, lots and lots of feedback from clients from uh, from being observed by other by other coaches uh, from sharing your ideas and your thoughts and your fears and your and, and your hopes with with uh, with other coaches um, it's important too that you understand the supervision process the more that you understand what supervision does the more likely you are to reflect before you have a uh, and come to supervision with real reflective um, 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 cons, um, outcomes. Um, can we be broader in our perspectives? One of, one of the things that we've been looking at at the moment is how we become, uh, if, if, how we develop compa greater compassion for our clients. What do we? What, how do we? How do we work with somebody who irritates us? Can we actually develop our level, uh, the state of our compassion? so that we can actually try actually um, work, um, value the facts that they irritate us. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a whole fascinating area. And sometimes learning by teaching, if we can work with other coaches and help them to think about what they're doing, we automatically learn from that process. So I promise to say something about learning maturity in the next slide, and, and, uh, or coach maturity. And, and what we find is that there are, four, we, from our data, that there are four levels of coach maturity. And that's on the next slide. Um, the, 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 the models based coaches really have a, a, a they, the, the, they have a basic tool um, the grow model or, or something like that I usually say that grow stands for get rich on waffle um, because it's very very limited and, and applies to a very small number of situations but <clears throat> once we have this 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 model space it gives us a way of, of going of going about it we end up doing coaching to the client as you develop a wider portfolio, you can start being a little bit more relaxed about it and have different ways of, 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 of experimenting with the client. And that, that you start doing coaching with the client. But it's a, quite a big mind shift to get from one to the other. 
it's an even bigger mind shift to go from being a philosophy coach to, to there to being a philosophy coach coach where you integrate what you do as a coach to the person that you are and then finally the most most mature coaches we've been able to observe we call them systemic eclectics tactics and you can see they hold the client or the client has the conversation that the client needs to have with themselves so these guys have immense calm they say very little of it they, they speak for about a third of the time that any other coaches do but at the same time um that they they, they do generate enormous energy in the room it, it, it's not energy from waving their arms around or, or, or from loudness they're very soft and they're very still but you it, it is there is an electricity in the room um, and so with these four levels of, of, of coaching, what we find is that the early levels, um, the coaching tends to concentrate on basic tools and techniques. Um, so it, it also, there's a, there's a strong emphasis from the supervisor, usually led by the supervisor, on the safety of the clients and a lot of confidence building. Um, with a virtual approach, with, with virtual assistance, we can, the supervisor can really open up the understanding of people, of the basic pitfalls that people and help them to wean them away from some of the simplistic assumptions about their coaching. And then the coach begins to realize that effective coaching is much more complex than they realized. And then you can start building them up towards philosophy-based and systemic eclectic uh, approaches. It's, that, it's in those last two that the, 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 the virtual world really comes into its own because now you're able, you have the tools to be able to recognize and work with the complexity um, and the nuances of the coaching relationships. So coaches bring to supervision a whole variety of things, but these tend to be the top, the top ones that we found. Things that, 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 that where that they find that they are, have a, a, a conflict in terms of, co of maintaining confidentiality. Boundaries they're not sure of. Conflicts of interest, like, you know, like being having a conflict, being having the, the uh, a contract with an organization that wants to know things about them and, and, and uh, that knows things what's going on, but, which they, but, but, the, or, but not being able to, or let me start again, there's a conflict of interest between the, the needs of the client and the needs of the organization, very, very frequent. So dual relationships, what's happening for them um, and what's happening for the, for the client, particularly the, the, the danger of, of relive or, or, or empathizing too much with the client and actually, and, and, and actually trying to put onto the client solutions that would work for you. Um, issues involving third parties, very difficult to deal with in, in supervision because you, 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 you don't know what's going on in the world of the, of the, or the mind of the third party, only the way that it's being interpreted by the by the coach um indeed it, or, or, um, so if the third, that's if the third party is the client if you've got another third party which is the clients uh, which is which is somebody that the, that the client brings or a relationship with somebody else you now you now you've now got now got three removes so you it can get very complicated and it's very easy to make assumptions and so we have to unpack all this and say well okay what do we know and what is actually and what actually it could be we could we completely misunderstand. And the last one that we find is very frequent is issues of self-doubt. What's going on for somebody um, um, in, in terms of their own confidence in their ability to coach? Most coaches at some point in those, tra in between the, in those transitions between one, one mindset and the other encounter a significant level of self-doubt. And supervision can help us to actually, uh, actually work through that. And, and so what so what, what we find is really helpful from virtual co virtual supervision is it really helps us understand what are the forces and then uh, play in each of these situations um what do we imagine what do we just assume um and, and so it, it helps to understand and, and recognize where there might be collusion we can personify collusion um as uh, as a uh, as an intermediary um, uh, and, and, and look at it and actually have a conversation with our colluding self. Um, there are many, many ways in which we can do this. So to prepare for supervision, we suspect we, we offer a number of ideas. Um, firstly, we want you, you, it's important to specify what we want supervision to do. Um, an example here, do we want some ideas on, on, how to, on how to deal differently with a particular kind of situation? Are we looking for reassurance? Um, or are we looking for something much deeper, something that actually will affect not just the way that we deal with this client for, for, for supervision, but all of our clients and something that will affect the way that we approach our entire coaching practice. Um, 
Uh, and so the more, and, and what we find is quite helpful is to, is to actually think about the metaphors. What metaphors actually describe what's happening for me here? If we have those metaphors, those will tend to be or can be reflected in, in the virtual supervision. And then some of the things we might, questions we might ask, where have you felt stuck? Where have you felt dissatisfied with the client outcomes? When things have gone well, but you're not sure why, what's going on here? What, what are the recurring patterns? What have you been avoiding thinking about in your practice? These are just some of the standard questions we would expect a coach to go through in thinking about their own, and preparing for their supervision. Um, and if they've done this pre-thinking, then the quality of the, of the virtual supervision is going to be much greater because they're already beginning to have in, the, in their subconscious mind some of, the, some of these ideas that will, that will actually allow them to, um, to bring more the, the system into play. We think it's also helpful super, through, from supervision to, to develop your internal supervisor. And what we're really talking about here is that the more that we can imagine our supervisor was sitting behind us when we're coaching, uh, the more effective our coaching is going to be. So um, when we start, we're often, uh, in supervision, we're often uh, surprised by some of the questions our supervisor asks. Just as in, in coaching, we, some our coaches are surprised by some of the questions we ask as coaches. Gradually, we begin to anticipate some of those questions so, and, we, and reflect upon them. Um, and then we begin to hear our super's voice as we reflect on our work internal, and so we can internalize that, that supervisor's voice. But equally, we can we can uh, we can hear it as we're doing it in a coaching session. That's the next slide. Yeah. As we get into the coaching session, um, <clears throat> we can we can actually have confidence that we're going to hear our supervisor when we need them to speak to us. Um, and slowly, we begin to integrate that voice of that external supervisor into ourselves into our own wisdom and that gives that's where our internalized supervisor our inner voice becomes ours it becomes integrated with who we are and then as the more supervisors we work with the, the more the, the more the more wisdom is gained by our inner by our inner voice our inner supervisor and this is a process which takes place over time but it, but talking to, to to many coaches and many supervisors this is it seems to be this is the way that it happens um, and we can welcome this and look forward to, to enabling that to happen. If we use this, if, if, and, and if we are using coaching with visual, within visual environments, it actually helps us to, um, we, we have a visual representation of that coach. It's not just in a disembodied voice. We have a, we, we, we actually have a, a visual um, a metaphor, if you like, for our, for, for, for our internal coach, or internal supervisor rather. So just to summarize, if we want to use virtual environments in supervision, uh, we can use it for just a straightforward supervision session. We can use it for preparing for a supervision session. So thinking through what, what, how would I do this if I were just using, just, just, uh, if, if, I, if I were just thinking through what are the dynamics of this situation. Once we've had a supervision session, we can go back and revisit things and say, okay, what was going on here? What am I having on it? What else can I see in this picture? We can use it for working with our internal supervisor <coughs> without actually taking something to, an to, to something to an external supervisor. And I think really important too, we, 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 it's important for us to, re to review the nature and the impact of our coaching relationships. And we, and we could certainly do that um, use, using the virtual environment. But I think too, supervisor and supervisee can use the whole process and this pattern of thinking to review the nature and impact of the supervision relationship itself. So I think there's, there's tremendous future for taking um, or using virtual environments to help us in, this, in making coaching supervision even more powerful than it is at the present. So that's a brief overview. Over to you, David. Thank you, David. Thanks very much indeed. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm not gonna forget that get rich on waffle. It's a great, great line, and, and my I have a supervisor that uh, Francis Batten, a wonderful man who was my supervisor for many years. Um, admit, wherever I go, he's somewhere around me and, and kind of on my back. Um, we're going to move into some live work now, and I thought we'd go straight into the live work, and we'll take questions at the end of the live work.